this morning we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John and continuing on. Now we're talking about the betrayal of Christ. Uh, prior to this, uh, we were looking at Christ's request to the Father to guard his disciples. And this is in John chapter 17, starting in verse 6, where he's talking about this. You know, I have manifested your name to them, the ones whom you gave me. And uh, now Christ is going to be leaving. So he asked the Father to guard them. Guard them from the malignantly evil one, as we were going through that, is not to take them out from the world. We as Christians are not called to separate into a different nation from the world. We are in all nations. Uh, our job is to bring the message of reconciliation. You know, so he doesn't ask that we're taken out of the world. He asks that we are protected from the malignantly evil one, which, of course, we do have protection from the malignantly evil one. Satan can't touch us. That is, a, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed, and I know there's some people who want to try to claim that, but if you're truly a Christian, you cannot be. And what do I mean by truly a Christian? I want to be careful with that terminology, because some people use that to manipulate people into to thinking that they're really not Christians. Do you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day? That is the only scriptural criteria for one who is a Christian. That's it. And if you believe that, Satan can't touch you. That doesn't mean he can't harass you by other means, but he cannot physically touch you. And then, of course, we have the armor of God. And when we put on the armor of God and we stand firm, what does Satan do? What's his response? Is to leave, because he knows he cannot defeat us at that point. So the Father did actually answer the prayer of Christ, ultimately in his resurrection. Now, in John chapter 17, and verse 20, we pick back up with the oneness of the church, because this is Christ ask, asking the Father that the church will be one in a similar way that the Father and the Son are one. I do not request, now this is in uh, John chapter 17, verse 20, I do not request for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. Now, this particular passage is where we see a connection to us today. Without this passage, we don't have a connection. He's talking about the disciples very specifically, but then he goes on to add those who will believe, and of course, that includes us. Uh, the word prayer here, if you have, uh, I'm using the New King James right now, and I know a lot of others do this, this word prayer actually means ask, make a request. Is not your normal word for uh, praying, like worshiping. So Christ is asking for all church saints at this point. Remember, the church is one body. He goes on in verse uh, 21, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So there is this oneness that Christ is actually requesting. Now, remember in the context here, this type of relationship with God has never existed before. This is very unique, what he is actually requesting. And we don't see this manifested, of course, until after the resurrection of Christ. When it comes to the Christ, remember the Christ is actually the new creation in which Christ is the head and the church is the body. When he was resurrected, God actually made this new creation. We see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 that the church is as one body. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is the Christ. Now, a lot of times our translations will drop the, the article there. They won't put in the because it, it sounds funny in English. But if you understand the reference, because he's not talking about the person of Christ, Jesus Christ is not many persons in one. That's not, there's nowhere in Scripture that would support that. Okay, It's talking about this new entity that we have where we are in Christ, where Christ is actually... Um, where God actually, when he raised him, 
he made Christ the last Adam, the life-giving spirit, where the first Adam was a soul, a living soul. And he passed that on to us. And of course, if we're in Adam, which all of us are, were, I should say, because those of the church are no longer in Adam. But being in Adam, his condemnation is passed to us. But now that we are in Christ, his righteousness is actually passed to us. So there's a distinction there. We're all part of one body. We actually have a connection to each other in the church, quite a distinct one. In Christ, there is no sex, race, or social distinctions. We are one body. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 talks about this. Among a few other passages, but this is one where it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. This does not ignore the fact that some of us are male and some of us are female. It doesn't ignore the fact that the social statuses are different because scripture also says if you're in a different social status or whatever social status you're in, do not seek to get into another one just because you're saved. Stay where you're at and be, uh, be content with where you are actually placed. This is talking about our relationship in the church. We have an equality. We have positions, and a good example of this is two of them are restricted to males only, but that doesn't mean the female is below the male, not in Christ. There's an equality. Okay? And this would be the pastor. Pastor is specifically um, restricted to a male. And deacons. Okay? Those two are actually restricted to only males. But again, that's not dividing us. That is for the benefit of the body. You know, the eye cannot do the job that the foot is supposed to do and vice versa. It doesn't work that way. You know, and um, that's what it ultimately is talking about there. But no, no, um, no status difference between sex, race, and um, the, what our social status is means we don't have in the local church we don't have a head and and what i mean by that is there's not somebody who rules over the local assembly it is the assembly together that actually well we work together we submit to each other for the benefits that it brings you know that's the kind of oneness he's talking about here we also see in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 where it's talking about this. And here it says, um, To them God willed, that is desirously willed, to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, in, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ actually indwells all of us. We have a oneness with him as we are connected to him. Christ has actually given his glory to the church. Now, this is not his glory in his deity. We of the church do not become gods. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of, um, well, I want to say outright cults, but those cults begin to affect assemblies that don't really hold on to the false beliefs of a cult, but yet bring in some, some very bad doctrine from them. There is nothing in us as humans that is salvageable in a way where we can, if we work hard enough, we can be good enough for God. It doesn't work that way. That is actually from cults, from false religions, where they bring that kind of garbage in. Okay? We also do not become deity. We do not become gods. Again, that's a false religion. Most Christian assemblies will not hold to that. They hold properly to the fact that oh, God is one, and he will always be one. But here, when he talks about this in, in John chapter 17, verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Remember, your word glory means to have or hold a proper opinion. 
So the proper opinion that the that the father has of Christ, Christ in his humanity. When we are actually raised, we are going to be like him. Our resurrection is of the likeness of Christ's resurrection. You see this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23, where it talks about, but each one, now of course in the context here, he's talking about resurrection. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. Now, Christ the first fruit, that is talking about the church. We are of the first fruits. We are of that same resurrection of Christ. And then after those at his coming, this particular coming is referring to when he actually returns to earth. When he, when he returns to earth, and he's not, it's not talking about when he comes and gets to church. It's talking about when he actually returns to earth, when he sets up his kingdom, there will be resurrected saints residing on earth at that point. Because he's going to raise all of the saints from all other dispensations. They're going to be raised at that point. Okay. So they are also going to, and of course, they are part of the first resurrection. Okay. The second resurrection, and this again is those areas where you need to understand Scripture properly in, so that you're not misinterpreting or misunderstanding things. Yes, all humans will be raised. Some will be raised to a second death. Others will be raised to life. If you're part of the first resurrection, it's life. If you're part of the last resurrection, it's death. Because God is going to raise all the humans and they're going to face, so this will be all the unsaved, and they're going to face the great white throne. And remember at the great white throne, they're not dealing with their sins, they're dealing with their works. Okay, but as we can see here, you know, it is Christ in each one in their own order, Christ the first fruit. We as Christians will actually be in the likeness of Christ. We see this over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we intuitively know that when we when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him with discernment just as he is. So we are going to be, we of the church are going to be like Christ. We're going to have that glory that he talks about. And again, it is his glory in his humanity. It is not his glory in deity. God does not share his glory with anyone. That is deity. There are no other gods. Therefore, through the church, the world is actually going to know Okay, here in verse uh, John chapter 17, verse 23, it says, And I and them, and you and me, that they may be made mature in one. The word perfect here does not mean perfect without flaw. It actually means to be brought to maturity. The church is brought to maturity in one, that unity that we have, that the world may experientially know that you have sent me, and you have loved them as you have loved me. The world experiences that by the church living out the life that they have in Christ, especially when the church is loving other saints, because they will see that and they will know that we are actually Christians. They'll experientially know that. You know, in some regards, you can see that the, the world even today very, very much knows that because they want that kind of type of love. So they'll come in and they'll demand that from Christians. Well, Scripture says you are to love one another. Therefore, you know, you must love me. You must accept me as I am. That's actually not love. And well, number one, first and foremost, Scripture says I am to love other Christians. That's specifically what it says. It uses a very specific term, love one another, as others of the same kind. Okay. Who did Christ actually say that to? Did he say it to the world? Did Christ ever say it in one of his sermons? He never said that to Israel. You don't have him saying that. 
you are to love one another. He said that to the disciples in the upper room when he's talking about the new relationship that's going to happen. And his two other Christians. And then the second part would be, to the world, we are to do good. Accepting a person in a corrupted state is not a beneficial thing for them. You know, and certainly if I'm going to express love towards them, I would not permit them to stay in that state or accept that because that's not doing what is best for them. So either way, they lose. So what do they do? They modify it. They start using terms like, well, love is love. No, actually, love is not love. There's a whole bunch of different types of love. You cannot define love by one word. You know, friendship is completely different from a marital relationship. Totally different. Different type of love. The fondness for an animal is completely different from the fondness of a human being. You know, you can't actually mesh those together. But the world wants to do that because they can see when the church is actually acting properly and we're loving one another, they see, they experience this. Now, they don't want the truth, but they do want the benefits thereof. So the world is actually going to know that the Father has sent the Son. We will be with Christ, John chapter 17, verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundations of the world. Now, the loving me before the foundations of the world is a reference to his person, and that, of course, would relate to his deity, but the glory that he's talking about here, again, it has to do with his humanity when he wrapped himself in flesh. Okay, it's, it, we're not going to be able to see the full glory of God. We can't actually look at God and understand him. It's going to take us, oh, I have no idea how much time it's actually going to be because once, once the new heavens and the new earth um, are created, we step outside of time. We don't have time, you know, um, but it's going to take us a very long, long period to understand God, you know, and he's going to be showing us through the ages of the ages more things about him. He's such an incredible being. We can, you know, it's just actually amazing even what he's shown us. So we're going to be continually learning about Christ. We're going to see him as he is. He will call the church to himself. And when it is time, he will call us. You see over in 1 Thessalonians an example of this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses starting in chapter 4 and 16 and 17. This is talking about when Christ actually returns for the church. For the Lord himself will descend from the heavens with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in, in clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with him. This cannot be the second coming of Christ, because where do we actually meet him at? We meet him in the air. Scripture is pretty clear. Also, by the way, it's not going to be a cloudy day. Because the clouds it's talking about here are actually clouds of believers. It's not actual clouds you see in, in uh, I've seen some try to reference that, you know, on a cloudy day, Christ might come. No, it's going to be clouds of believers. We're going to just suddenly be in our resurrected bodies. You know, it's quite, when this happens, and by the way, don't be so foolish as some people to think, especially if you haven't actually expressed a proper belief in the fact that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. Don't think you can push that off until you hear the trumpet. There's a couple of problems there. Number one, the trumpet is for God's children. If you're not God's child, there's no indication you're going to hear it. Okay. The shout is not for humans. The shout 
when you understand the context here, the shout is to tell the demons to get out of the way. How do I know that? Who's doing the shouting? The archangel. The head angel. Why would the head angel shout? Because when he speaks, all other angels must obey. Spirit, the spirit realm, they understand the order of things. They don't step out of order. We as humans, we step out of order, and it's very improper for us to do that. They understand that. Okay. So Christ is going to descend. There's going to be the shout. There's going to be the shout of the archangel telling the demons, move it. Get out of the way. Church is coming through. You will not hinder them. And then we are going to, in our resurrected state, be called up to God. This is all, by the way, going to happen in a period of time. We call it a twinkling of an eye. But literally, that means in a period of time that cannot be divided. Now, you think about the time and how much we divide time nowadays, especially even in comparison to what they were doing back when this was written. So you take it as, actually, I think it uses the word as, a, as an atom. It's like dividing an atom. Well, you can't, if you divide an atom, bad things happen. It's not, it doesn't work that way. And what I mean by that is you can't hear it and then believe God and be saved. If you're hearing the message, you better believe it now because you might not hear it again. He might not call you again. You know, God's under no obligation to save a single person on this earth. You cannot go to God and claim salvation. And what I mean by that is you can't make a claim to it. It's offered free. The only way we can, we can receive salvation is to accept it. But Christ is going to call us to his own. We are actually citizens of heaven. This is where our citizenship belongs. This is why we as Christians here on earth are not called to create our own nation. There is one nation that belongs to God, and that is Israel, and will always be Israel. God is very clear on that. We have two covenants that specifically relate to Israel, and because of those covenants, well, actually in Matthew chapter 5, he talks about this, the earth will be preserved because Israel is a light and the salt of the earth. They preserve the earth because God has not only made them a promise for land now, but he has made a promise for land in eternity. And that's why the new heavens and the new earth will come about. But our citizenship, and literally this is where the word politics comes from, so our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, when, when he actually comes, it talks about the fact that who will transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the workings by which he is able to even to subdue all things unto himself. So we're going to be like Christ. And this is in his communication before his resurrection to the Father that this be fulfilled. And it will be, of course. The disciples know that the Father sent the Son. You know, when you, uh, as Christ is coming to the end of his ministry in some of his requests to the disciples, they very clearly understood that he is the Messiah and he is the Son of God, that the Father sent him. In verse 25, it also talks about this, John chapter 17, verse 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. 26 goes on and says, and I have declared to you, or to them, your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Again, talking about the new relationship that we're going to have. That the love that we as church, as members of the church should have towards each other, which is seeking the best for each other. That should be a primary focus of the local assembly, is seeking the best for those who are members. You know, fulfilling the commandment that we have actually been given. 
In chapter 18, we then pick up with the betrayal of Christ at this point. So Christ has made his request to the Father. He's asked the Father to protect us, and he's asked the Father to bring us into a oneness. And of course, that oneness involves the fact that we are now in one body. We are many, many members, but we're all part of one body. And now this is all going to come about. In chapter 18 and verse 1, when uh, Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Hidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. So they're going out into the Garden of Gethsemane at this point. Uh, Christ went there to communicate again specifically to the Father. Now this is this is separate from what we have recorded because the disciples actually were not directly with him at this point. Some of them were close by, but they weren't directly with him. You see this over in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. And then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. Now your word pray here, it does relate to worship. Peter, James, and John are with Christ while he's communicating with the Father. So they're closer to him. He actually separates these uh, these three out. You see this over in Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Then they came to the place where his name Gethsemane, and he said to uh, his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John with him and began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Because about, you know, he's about to face some pretty uh, pretty severe things. Judas is aware of this place because Christ comes here all the time. This is one of those areas I was thinking about the other day. It's like if you, we really understand now, now Jesus is God in the flesh. The things that he does are really important to pay attention to. You know, the, this is not what doing what Jesus would do in his earthly ministry. This is paying attention to how he relates not only to God the Father, but also to the creation around him. And oftentimes, Jesus would separate himself and rest. In his human nature, he would rest. So much so that Judas, one of his disciples, was fully aware, this is the place where we're going to go. We actually, as, as humans, should have places where we can go and just rest, take some time off, you know, relax from, from life, Relax, especially as Christians, from having to deal with the constant onslaught of unbelievers and the unrighteousness that we live in in this world. Just taking a break, just like Christ did, is an example here. So, and, and this is in verse 2, like I said, John 18, 2. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Um, he often met here. Judas then receives the detachment of troops that he is going to take. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Now, a detachment here, by the way, is approximately 600 men. You know, we, we don't really... You know, when you're reading this, it, it doesn't really develop the fact that this is a huge amount of men for one man. They're really making this look like he's a really bad person and they're expecting a, a battle. That's what they're actually doing here. So it's around, uh, this detachment is uh, around 600 men. That would be a battalion today. A full-on battalion. Yeah, this is, uh, I think this was half of a, uh, I have to go look at it again. See if I can find it. Eh, they don't have it uh, listed here. Um, so I don't remember all of the way that they call it because it wasn't a full battalion. But it was basically half of one. Uh, at least for theirs. But for us, yeah. I mean, could you imagine 600 men, a massive, that would be a massive amount of people coming out. That would be like us sending 600 police officers to arrest one man. That's what they actually did. 
Jesus asks them at this point, what are you here for? Who are you seeking? Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. Now, he has an intuitive knowledge. It's not an experiential knowledge. The word here is intuitive. He's fully aware. And how is he aware of this? Because of his deity? I think, actually, you could take this back in his humanity in looking at Old Testament scripture. Because doesn't Old Testament scripture actually prophesy about this? It actually does. Okay. So he knew this is what was going to happen. He had an intuitive knowledge. This is what was going to happen. So he knew all the things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, who are you seeking? They then answer him and say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. So Judas is going to be there, of course, because he's the one who betrayed them. Now, in other passages of Scripture, it talks about the fact that uh, Judas came, uh, drew, or came up to him and, and kissed him, or attempted to kiss Christ. And that's where Christ says, are you going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Because he knew exactly what Judas was doing. And I think it kind of, you know, if you think about it, it would be pretty obvious if one of your friends brought 600 police officers over to your house, you would kind of be thinking, um, what you're doing, you don't have a good plan. When Jesus actually said this, this is the only area where this is recorded, but when Jesus said this, um, this is in verse 6, now when he said to them, I am he, and he doesn't really say, I am he, he actually says, I am the I am. Now, the one who is saying this has a lot of power in it's expressed. Because he is actually saying, if you understand scripture, he is saying, I am God. I am the I am. Very emphatic in the way that he's saying this. Um, I am he. So I am. I am my part am is literally what he's saying. They drew back and fell to the ground. Now, by the way, I'm not saying he's saying to them he is God. He is declaring that he is Christ, Jesus Christ, the one that they're looking for. But when he did this, he did it with such intensity that they actually fell to the ground. And then they asked him again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, uh, that it is me. I am on my part am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Now, normally, of course, if you have a, a group of men that they're coming, you know, again, you have 600 uh, soldiers at this point. They're just going to arrest everybody. But Jesus does exactly what he was instructed to do because none of the disciples, except for Judas, was, was going to be lost. All the others were protected. So here he actually um, basically secures their release. He says, you're looking for me. You're not looking for these men. I'll go with you, these men you need to release. And they actually did. Jesus, or Simon responds kind of in a bad way here. Uh, and we see this in um, down in verse, uh, actually I'm a little bit further down in my notes here. Because, yeah, we're uh, in verse 10. So in 1810, uh, we see Judas actually, or no, this is uh, Peter. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now remember, Peter said, I will die for you. Okay? You see his actions here. Do you think Peter could have taken on 600 men? No, these aren't just 600 men. These are 600 soldiers that are trained to actually kill. He had no chance, but yet was still willing to fight for Christ. It shows that Peter was not a coward. This is actually very important because when it comes to Satan attacking us, he will take those we perceive as the most courageous and bring them to their knees. That's where it's so important for us as Christians to actually rely upon Christ. You know, so Peter drew his sword. Now, when Peter actually said, I'll die for you, and this, these things aren't true, uh, G remember, Jesus actually rebuked him. said, get behind me, adversary. 
Um, that word, uh, when it where it's, it's translated as he says to Peter, "Get behind me, Satan." That is, he's not calling Peter Satan. He's using the actual word for adversary. But Peter then responds, and he cuts off the ear of the of the high priest servant. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given to me? Then the detachments of, of the detachment of troops and captains and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, Jesus actually does restore, it doesn't actually say it here in John, but he actually does restore the man there. Now, again, to me, this, you know, it's it's amazing how corrupt and how blind our minds can be when we reject God. Because here is a man who does things that no human being can do. You know, he just put an ear back on and healed it. I mean, well, no human can actually do that. And yet they're still willing to move forward with arresting him. And they do. They arrest him at this point in, in verse 11 and 12. And um, and they're going to lead him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. So at the very beginning, they're not even taking him to the high priest. And this does involve a... Um, a trial that is done, by the way, at night, which is not legal under the law, the Mosaic law, I mean. Uh, he's going to be brought in for a trial. He's going to be accused. Um, he is an innocent man at this point and always has been. But they remember, the high priests and the chiefs and the uh, scribes and the elders have been seeking a way to justify putting Christ to death because they knew who he was. He called them out exactly for who they were, too. You know, calling them vipers and whitewashed tombs. You know, because they, they say one thing, they try to make themselves look good, but on the inside, they're just full, well, as he describes it, they're just full of dead men's bones. They're, they're defiled. And Jesus actually knew that. They also knew that he was the Messiah. Scripture does actually reveal that to us. I'm not going through a lot of the detail because we just went over on Resurrection Sunday. A lot of details related to the, to the death and resurrection of Christ. One of them that I think is very essential for Christians to understand is this is happening on Tuesday night. This doesn't happen on Friday. Christ is not crucified on a Friday. Christ is crucified on a Wednesday. And why is that so important? Because what does Scripture say? What actually is the gospel for salvation? Christ died for our sins, and he was raised in one and a half fish, two or three days. No. Well, where do I get that from? Try counting from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That doesn't add up. Oh, you can say Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are three days, but that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says he was in the grave for three days and three nights. You can't get three nights out of there. Three days, three nights. It's just being accurate with Scripture. He was uh, crucified on a Wednesday. What is happening here is on Tuesday night which again makes it illegal. But, and, you know, they're they're um, maliciously e evil at this point, and they're not really obeying but the law. So Jesus is bound. He's led away to Caiaphas. As a high priest, Caiaphas is actually, or well, here he's led away to Annas first and then to Caiaphas. But, you know, it's actually Caiaphas as the high priest who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And he was prophesying, he didn't even realize he was prophesying, but he was actually prophesying that Christ was going to die. He was actually stating that, which is very interesting. Now, he is the high priest, so he would actually prophesy in that sense. Peter and John do follow at this point. So you see this down in verse 15, where now Simon, uh, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, 
Now, the other disciple in the context here is actually the one who's writing the book, which would be John, or the letter here. So he never really describes himself by name. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. So John and his family, they actually had a relationship with the priests, and, and they knew who he was. So he was permitted in with no issue. However, Peter, he didn't go in. Now, he could have gone in, but he chose to stay stand at the door outside. Uh, <clears throat> then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, Are you not also one of, of this man's disciples? Are you with him? You know, thought I've seen you with him. Now, there is no issue here of fear in the sense that he's going to be suddenly arrested. She's just asking him a question. Okay. Now, the servants and, um, okay, his response, by the way, is, I am not. Jesus told him he was gonna, this was going to happen. When he said, I will die for you, he said, Simon, it's not even going to become morning before you deny me three times. You know, before before you hear the rooster screaming out that morning has come, you will deny me three times. This is number one. Now the servants and the officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was a cold night. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And the high priest then asked Jesus at this point about his disciples and his doctrine. And it does use the word doctrine here, which is good, because Jesus is actually teaching them, he's giving them instructions on how they are expected to live their life. Matthew chapter 5, verses, well, it's, it's chapter 5 through chapter 7. At the end of chapter 7, they were astonished at his doctrine because he was giving them instructions on how they were to live. He was not adding to the Mosaic law. He made it very clear he's not adding to the Mosaic law. But there's a clean distinction. Okay. He was giving them instruction in relation to how they are to live in his kingdom. So the high priest, now the high priest here would be Annas at this point. He asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answers him in such a such an, an awesome way when you think about it. Why is it so awesome? Because Jesus doesn't try to explain it to him. He just says, ask everybody else. I haven't done anything in secret. You don't need me to tell you. I don't need to testify of myself. Others will testify of what I actually said. It's such a, a good way to actually represent yourself because it's like, it's not my word. Go check out everybody else's word. And Jesus answered, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temples where the Jews always met. And in secret, I have said nothing. And this is true. He never said anything in secret. The only thing he would do in times where it was just him and the disciples is he would explain things to them. But if others actually had come and listened to him, he would have explained it to them also. It wasn't done in secret, completely open. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. So go ask all of them. They, they're fully aware of what I actually said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, if I have spoken bad, this word evil is bad, if I've spoken something that's wrong, bear witness of the wrong. But if I do proper, why do you strike me? Which, you know, if you think about it, Christ's response was a proper response. 
because it was not him defending himself. He says, go and look at the witnesses that say what I'm actually saying. So it's not me arguing with you over what I said or what I didn't say. Let's go testify. That's actually quite an appropriate response to the high priest and quite a respectful one under the Mosaic law because you had their witnesses and you had witnesses. But the, you know, of course, here you have the corrupt guards who are supporting them and they strike him and Jesus is like, why did you strike me? Uh, we then have Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest at this point. Um, let's see, the, then in verse uh, 24 through 27, we have the second denial of Peter. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, therefore they said to him, are you not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. Now again, He's not in a situation where he's in danger. It's just the servants asking him. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him who, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Dude, did I not see you in the garden with him? Then Peter denied again, and immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter realized what had happened. He denied him three times. Peter was not a coward again. Some people want to say that Peter was cowardly, but Scripture shows he was not a cowardly man. He would have died for Christ, no problem. Satan sifted him, and because of that, he became spiritually a, a spiritual coward, where he normally would not have been. Now, Christ permitted this for our benefit. Because after the resurrection, he restores Peter, and he actually places him as a shepherd over the flock, you know, as a pastor. Okay. And he did this for our benefit. It's kind of the same thing as going back to the book of Job. Why did God permit such things to happen to Job? Well, if you understand what's happening, we actually see all the methods Satan uses to get us to act independently from God. God laid out Satan's entire plan, made it visible to us. He did the same thing with Peter, because later Peter, what does he say? What's Peter's response to this? Resist the devil and he will flee. Peter wasn't resisting properly. You know, and he learned his, his point there. Now we have the um, rejection of the Messiah at this point, and the Jewish leaders they don't enter into the um, praetorium. They take him to Pilate at this point. Uh, the Jewish leaders then accuse Christ before Pilate, but they accuse him of violating Roman law, not specifically of the, of the uh, uh, Jewish law. The Jewish leaders seek to have Christ put to death. Pilate then questions Jesus. Pilate finds that Jesus, there's no fault in him. But then we have the, the rejection of the Messiah and the Jews, and this is in John chapter 18, verse 30 through 40, 39 through 40 is where we actually have the rejection of Christ, where the people, the high priests, they all actually say, you know, crucify him, crucify him. And they release one who is actually a murderer instead of one who is innocent. Uh, now, like I said, I'm kind of going over that a little quickly because... We just recently went over that in detail in, uh, in relation to uh, Resurrection Sunday.